All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our ISTE webinar. Um, our topic tonight is going to be on how we can engage our families um, from brick buildings to kitchen tables, supporting our families during the pandemic. And so we're really going to talk a lot about how we can make those connections. Um, even though we are not in person, we still have an, a duty as educators to still make those connections. So if you are joining us live, feel free to tweet out um, and tag us at Dig Equity PLN and also use the hashtag is the DPLN as well because we want to hear from you. So I am your moderator tonight. I am Patricia Brown and I am going to have a wonderful opportunity to have a great conversation with some fantastic panelists that we have. And so just to get us started, I just wanted to do a quick check in and ask you guys how you're doing and how you are maintaining right now. And a part of your answer, just kind of introduce yourself and let us know um, how you're doing and what you what you're doing currently, what your what your life is looking like, uh, feeling like, and just kind of fill us in. So let's start. Let's start with Matt. Hey everybody, my name's Matt Highfield. I'm from Beaverton, Oregon. I'm a teacher on special assignment, and I, specifically, I work with digital curriculum, digital equity, and equity issues in general in our district. Um, and I'm really honored and excited to be presenting with such uh, such a great panel of folks here today. Really, uh, a lot of expertise in in webinar. And to answer your question, Patricia, I'm you know I'm doing okay um, here in Oregon. A couple of weeks ago. We had some really bad fires and it, air quality was really bad and uh, you know people that we knew you know were losing um, losing their dwellings and houses um, um, but the rains have come and people are starting to put their lives back together and uh, it's it's you know just a crazy crazy world we live in right now a lot of things going on but thanks for asking I appreciate that Definitely. I'm glad you are safe um, where you are. Um, glad to see that you're doing okay. All right. Um, Chantel, how's it going? You're muted. Oh. Oh. Unmute yourself first. It's like in the classroom every day, all day. <laughs> it's, it's going. It's every day is a new day, which is nice. Uh, I teach sixth grade science and computer science to 120 some odd kids and they they keep me positive and I have my own three kids here at home that are still doing online learning so while I'm teaching they're here with me and it's the students they're keeping me sane they they're still kids so thank goodness thank goodness for the kids definitely mm -hmm. Kim how's it going everybody it's going is it going <laughs> um it is i think everybody's super busy just like i um was just listening to um uh, matthew and chantelle i mean i think it's just all everywhere um but i do think you know now we can look at you know kind of where people are using technology now <laughs> so i'm excited about that um but i'm not going back Talk right. about job security. <laughs> right, talk about job security. Um, so that's a good thing. So if you look at the silver lining, people are actually using technology in the classroom. But I'm the director of engagement, and I um, help districts um, with um, a lot of um, when you think of single sign-on and when you think of um, making sure um, they're spending less time um, logging in and making sure that they're learning. Um, I assist districts with that. Awesome. And last but not least, Christian. Mr. Hi, Padgett, my name is Christian. How's it going? It's going okay. Uh, my name is Christian Padgett. I'm an assistant principal here in Atlanta. Um, 
one thing I can say about my job is that it is all encompassing. I deal with everything from instruction to operations, as well as a new hat this year is playing tech support. Um, so I will say, how am I doing? Um, uh, like my model is, you got to say two plus two equals five because you got to carry the one. That's that's my best way of putting it. You got to carry that one. Carry the one. That's a good way to put it. Good way to put, to put it. You may hear my children in the background. They are have been virtual, so they are letting loose in the evening as normal, but I'll try to make sure I keep them contained. Oh, all right, so let's jump into our questions. Um, again, this topic and this title, um, kudos to Matt for coming up with this great catchy title of from kitchen tables to, uh, from, I'm sorry, from brick, brick buildings to kitchen tables. And the fact is most of our students right now are learning at either a kitchen table, sometimes in their bedroom, sometimes on the floor, it, wherever they can find the learning space, that is what's happening. And so how do we keep that same engagement? So one of the things I want to ask first is during this pandemic, because um, remember, we are still in a pandemic. What is one of the greatest challenges that you have seen has occurred since March? I know a lot of us have been engaged in this nonstop since March. So what are some things that you have encountered? What are some of the challenges you have encountered um, that you witnessed so far? Anybody want to jump in first? I'll go first. Um, what I think some of the challenges that I've seen has been around connectivity. Um, one thing I can say about being in this area, because I, I work in the city, you know, uh, we have access to a lot of things, but even though sometimes you feel like you have access or should have access, you realize how uh, how much people still don't have access to pieces. So it's still trying to make sure that people are connected. Um, something as simple as, hey, we're supposed to, we provided you with hotspots, but you realize like a teacher might say, my kid hasn't gotten on the internet today or a student of mine hasn't gotten on the internet. Then you realize, hey, it might be because while you have these tools, you still don't have lights on at home. You still might be homeless. So it's a connectivity piece. That's been one of the uh, greatest things I can say that we've probably been challenged with right now. And also keeping in mind kids' home lives. Um, so yeah. Definitely, I think that's something that sometimes we forget. Even if your district is fortunate enough to pass out devices, are you also passing out those hot spots and making sure that the connectivity is there? Because one of the, the challenges of being in a pandemic is a lot of times districts have relied on like community based places like the library or like different facilities where the kids could sit outside and get the connectivity. Well, a lot of those spaces aren't open due to the pandemic. So how do we meet those challenges? Anybody else want to jump in and share some of the challenges that they've they faced? You know, I think one for me and Christian, you kind of tagged into this was it still, it just further looks into the core of where a lot of these struggles are at basic needs that aren't being met and looking at why they're not being met. And they're just becoming more and more in every the public's face, but who's doing something about it is like my biggest frustration is okay it's real it's here like it is so hard to ignore it now but there's so many other factors playing into why things aren't getting solved like that is extremely difficult but that's also an adult problem you know a grown-up problem those that can vote kind of problem and i think my other challenge is like you know we know kids are resilient kids can like mine, we've been doing this now. This is week eight, week nine. They're rolling with it. We're having a good time. We've gotten into a good groove for the most part. Like it's chill. It's good. It's adults who are still struggling with, well, the year of what it should have been. Well, it shouldn't be like this. It's like they're grieving that loss still. And I think it's holding on to our kids and our kids, are, it's keeping them from being able to move forward to at least embrace 
the technology field that we're doing and it's kind of holding kids back. So it's like, okay, we, we've made peace with it. This year is not how we wanted it or expected it, but what are we going to do next? So I think that's my other challenge is, okay, can we move on now? Like, I'm ready to go. Let's make it better kind of thing. Totally agree. You made some fantastic points about how as the adults, we got to make these changes. We, it's exposed. We all know what's happening. Um, it's no hiding. We, we pulled that sheet back, the cover back, the pull the blank, um, band-aid off so harshly. And so we have to address these issues because we can no longer um, not address them. And one of the things that I wanted to point out is that a lot of times people are very shocked by what's happening in the classroom. Um, and I think more so now there is exposing some things that are happening, but it's always been happening. But I think the difference is you have a parent on the other side of the computer as well that's listening in to what's happening. And then they're being a lot more vocal. So I think that's a challenge on both ends as the teacher. It can be a bit intimidating to be on Zoom and have a room full of adults listening in, but at the same token, it also gives parents an insight on what's happening in the classrooms and maybe even seeing their children and maybe some areas where they need some growth and they can be more supportive. So I think there's, there's both sides to this coin here that we can definitely speak to. Anybody else wanna jump in? Sure, I was just gonna add, uh one or two things. Um, one thing that's happened to us is our assumptions have been challenged about connectivity and what it means to be connected. Um, we're doing a pretty good job at getting most families connected. Uh, we have a hotspot program, but what we didn't plan on was that um, our hotspot program that we've had for a couple years, um, it wasn't built for um, full-time um, distance learning. So a lot of our hotspots have hit data caps and in Zoom eats up data pretty quickly. And so we've been having kids getting kicked out of, you know, Zoom rooms or, you know, frantically calling, what can I do? Um, and then just, you know, how we define connectivity. Um, some families will say, oh, well, we have internet, you know, we, we internet connection, but if it's their phone, um, that isn't going to work for, you know, the types of things we want for the classroom. So um, we're reworking what our assumptions are and trying to, you know, make our program better so that we don't leave um, students um, behind, um, which we currently are. I mean, as everyone knows, the pandemic is, is punishing our most vulnerable students. And so we're just working hard with that. And then, um, as already been mentioned, teachers are, are you know, reframing how they teach. Um, and they're certainly getting a lot better at technology, which is great. But just how you teach and how you engage students, that's, that's a big challenge during the pandemic. Definitely true. Uh, I think sometimes we are so, um, we're so wanting to normalize everything. Um, and that's natural because we're, we're over this. I'm over 2020. I'm over this pandemic. I'm over all of this. But I think at the same token, it is also an opportunity to look at how we have been doing things. And we can't just replace in-person teaching with virtual teaching. It's absolutely not the same thing. And we cannot do exactly what we were doing. And some of that is good and some of that is bad. And we just have to find out where that balance is and how do we make it work. So on that note, let's move on to our next question, and that is about communication. Um, I wonder, I'm wondering what it's been like for you to communicate with your families. How have you been able to keep that line of communication open? Um, in our district, we, we transferred to a different communication system. Instead of using just email, we're using an app called Parent Square, which allows the parents to download the app and get um, real-time um, notifications to their phone via text message or, or an alert through the app. And so some people love it and some people are hating it. So just curious, what are some ways that you've been able to keep that communication going with your families? 
Got it. One Um, I'll go ahead. I'll just speak from a community um, perspective from just seeing, um, you know, a lot of um, things posted on Twitter and social media um, in regards to um, what I've seen, um, you know, hosting webinars for parents. Um, I think those are um, a really good piece to, you know, hone in on the parent and, you know, just speak to the parent. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of parent trainings happening. Um, with a lot of districts um, across the nation, honestly, and parents are, you know, asking for more trainings as well. Um, I've seen, you know, parents saying, hey, I really want to learn, you know, what's happening right now. Um, so I think that's a, a great way. And, and it really, honestly, if you think about it, um, that's some in the way more involvement that some, you know, districts have seen from, you know, parents when you think about um, the older um, students, you know, when they get to secondary, you know, you, you might see one or two people at the PTA meetings. Um, so I think um, that's a, a good way looking in a positive, um, you know, aspect of it um, as well. Definitely. I'm glad you brought up that opportunity to, to engage the parents through webinars, parent universities, you know, I think that is, I think it was critical to, at the very beginning of all of this, to engage the parents as quickly as you can, because they were navigating it in a way that, um, and then it, it was two, two foes, if you are a parent and an educator trying to navigate both spaces, right, Chantel, that was, that was difficult. So you need a map as well. So having those websites that were up, there were some great websites. I remember, Kim, in your old district, you had a great um, parent uh, website uh, uh, information space that the parents knew they can go to that place only and get the information that they needed in order to be able to navigate what the district is doing. Anybody else have some great communication strategies? Um, Christian, I, I'm going I'm to ask you to share kind of what you you and your um, principal uh, was doing, and I don't know if you guys are still doing it with the read alouds. I thought that was a fantastic way to engage your families in a way that um, can build that home school connect. So one of the things that we actually, I'm glad you brought that up last year at the end of the, well, I'm not even gonna say at the end of the year when the pandemic began, we actually did a nightly bedtime story. My principal and I will alternate days. And if I had Monday, Wednesday, Friday this week, I had Tuesday, Thursday, the next weekend, vice versa for him. Um, but it was a great way just to see the kids be able to interact with them. They could see us, um, honestly, even though we did it on Facebook Live, sometimes they might send us a video within uh, of what they're doing and how they're listening, a parent might, and put it into the Facebook group. And so it was great in that sense. Um, what was also nice is because it's in our Facebook group, you can always come back and watch the video later. So if you missed the story, you can always see it later as well. So we did like that. We're actually about to get ready to revamp that. I will say right now, it's been kind of busy tossing up uh, trying to run a virtual building and still a physical building right now. But in terms of communication, one of the things that I definitely think helped this year is my principal made a one-stop shop on our webpage for all parents. So when it comes time to actually get figure out how you need to log into Zoom and authenticate your account, what is the daily schedule, how to work on those things. So I think those things also help. One of the things that seems really simple, but I think has made a world of a difference is for our uh, District F also purchased Remind 101. So just being able to push out a quick text message to parents. I know with us, even with our teachers, when we need to send out something really important, we send that out via Remind versus sending an email. Because we know you're going to pick up your phone before you pick, read your email. I mean, let's be honest. We've all been guilty of it. We get an email from our supervisor maybe, what, three weeks before, and we finally read it three weeks later. What that read receipt? And we finally, and they finally say, oh, we read that three weeks later. But I know that has been one of the things that has truly helped. We're about to get ready to do a town hall next week for our parents as well via Zoom and push out through Facebook Live. And then last but not least, I will say our biggest communication tool has been our teachers. Just making sure that they have come. And I will say truly my unsung hero, because you know, no matter how much you reach out to families or no matter how much you do for people, Sometimes they just don't always come back. And that big person that has become our unsung hero, I got to say, is our social worker. My social worker is phenomenal. It's not where it's the taboo thing of where I'm trying to come in and take your kids from you or anything. No, I'm just trying to see how do you need help? What do you need help with? And that has made a big transformation. I'm telling you to the point 
when we have login rates for people for our overall school above 90 percent and we have every demographic of student in our school so that has been tremendous um i'm not sure what about you all um that's that's good stuff and it you know schools are doing a lot of all community communication through you know remind or um phone calls that go home um, or you know websites one thing just to add to the conversation um are actually two smaller things that we've done in addition to those we started a student help desk because um where that's staffed um five days a week for eight hours and uh, for students or families to call in if they're having issues with connectivity or programs. And we realized right away that we needed to staff it with uh, more Spanish speakers than we had. Um, so we so we did. And, and that's, you know, um, the phone call numbers have been off the charts. And that's because when a student's having connectivity problems, they need help right away or their Chromebook doesn't work. Um, so I am going to put an article on that in the chat if anyone's interested, don't feel obligated. Um, and then one other thing that we did, we've, um, we've started piloting some apartment outreach projects, um, socially distanced, and it's gonna get hard when the weather gets bad, but we, um, we got uh, a battery powered projector and uh, a screen and we, you know, work, working with schools to find out apartment complexes that are the most highly impacted. And so, um, you know, make phone calls to parents for coming at this time. And um, so that's, that's been really interesting. I'm gonna uh, put a link to that project too. Um, and, it, you know, uh, the, one, the one, our first one, there was maybe just eight or nine parents there, but those eight or nine parents didn't have to walk or drive to school a lot of them might not have had transportation and they were asking questions on how to log in and how to help their kids and so um, for our most vulnerable families um, meeting them where they're at going to their apartment complexes and trying to figure out how to do that during a pandemic because um, you know we all had masks and microphones and stuff and um, so that's a couple of things to add to the conversation absolutely love that Matt I have not heard of any district that has had a program like that I've heard about the buses and you know put the Wi-Fi on the buses but to actually go out to the families' homes in a, in a in a way that you're saying I think is that's that's that is definitely reaching um, out to your community and helping to um, tackle equity inequity so that is pretty awesome pretty awesome all right so um let's move on and chat a little bit more about that whole connecting our family so as i mentioned earlier um a lot of districts are passing out those devices and we got all this money out of the i don't know a lot of districts just came up with some money that you wonder like where was that money in august but it hey whenever it shows up it shows up so I'm just wondering how you all are able to still create those um, opportunities for the parents and the families to stay engaged. I know Matt gave us this phenomenal um, example, and it might be hard to top that example of going out and doing that, um, connecting the parents with the apartment outreach. But maybe you can reach back and think about some things that your districts or you have done personally to create those connections and maybe even maybe some ideas for our listeners to engage in that they could possibly do also with their families. You know, um, like district wide, my districts had the tech department and then pretty much it was all hands on deck. Anyone who could be allocated for during the day, if a parent or someone who's having trouble with technology or you know technology breaks they're doing like a drive up drop off fix it replace it kind of service at the main center 
and we've got hot spots for kiddos that are in need of it. And as soon as we find out they're in need of it, and a couple of our kids have been able to take the cap off the data for the hot spot because like you said, Patricia, it Zoom eats it up doing that all day. And so district wide been trying to really get just in the hands and making it as open as possible because when that technology breaks, that's frustrating as can be. So our parents are able or whatever adult, you know, is available for them can come and do that. And as far as, you know, just the classroom, like being a classroom teacher still, it's just reaching out to my parents and saying, checking in. It's just a quick, how's it going? Uh, Cause I started off the year letting them know, look, I've got my three kids at home too. Here's our space. Here's what we're working. I'm doing the same thing you are. So I get it. There is no judgment. And I have found letting them know that there is no judgment because I'm making the same mistakes and the same things are going crazy. I'll, they have been so forthcoming with questions or just anything. So I've done like sitting down with parents after school uh, through a Zoom call just to help a kid set up reminder alarms on their computer so they know when their next class period starts because they get distracted and sitting down just to help a family through, okay, we need to do the main sign in and clever instead of going through Zoom and this and this and this, because then this is why different issues are arising. Just helping parents and the children and any adults you know that work with them figure out what some of those tech things are. But the biggest key is making it a non-judgmental space. Like they've got to believe that truth and you've got to live that truth so that they'll be comfortable enough to even ask for help. Because if they don't ask, it's really hard to find out. And, or it'll take months and months and months to find things out. Definitely. You, so you I wish it were an easier point. trick to just be like, boom, I use this website, we're good. But that's no, not really. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's not gonna be an easy fix or trick this right now. We are navigating uncharted territory. You know, mm -hmm. we've been saying that time and time again. One of the things that um, came to mind about our district, you, you, you realize that everybody, all hands on deck at this point. Like, mm -hmm. no matter what your role is, no matter what your position is, sometimes you just got to jump in. And so I'm, I'm seeing that a lot in our buildings. Um, and like, uh, one thing that I thought about um, was our counselors are putting together lunch, lunch um, Zooms for different grade levels. So they'll create the breakout rooms or the different activities to let the kids just have a, you know, be able to have conversations mm -hmm. with their friends. They are missing that social piece. Um, they're missing that recess time because when they're in the actual Zoom call, now I will, I will say there are some teachers that have like that Friday af afternoon Zoom for all, like you can have your fun times, but for the most part is learning taking place. And the, for the most part, they are muted. <laughs> <laughs> during a session so to be able to have the opportunity to just have a space that that educator and where the kids can just talk and communicate with one another get to see their friends maybe friends from a different class because they're in zoom they're only with their class whereas at recess they're used to have their friends with a grade level so i think that thinking outside of the box is super important um because we are in a we're in a pandemic and we're in a space where we're having to try to meet the needs of all our kids in a way that's very different than what we are used to doing. Um, so anybody else, anybody else want to share just some ideas on some out of the box, maybe thinking ways that they're creating some engagement for so their family. One thing I know that I want to do, I actually talked with uh, my admin team about it the other day. And I'm about to work with a parent on this. One thing that I thought about is that for many of our kids, they haven't seen each other since March uh, 13, 2020. So, you know, we're at a point now we haven't seen each other in seven months. And on top of that, uh, we haven't had a chance to interact in, I don't know about you all, but in terms of our virtual schedule, our virtual school schedule is shorter than what our typical day would be. And we already know how challenging it can be to get through your normal during that time. So imagine what it's like now during this space. And as a result, one thing I realized when I had to go step in for a teacher and she got kicked out of her Zoom class and I was like, let me hear if you can get back in. I'm gonna hold your class for you. While I was holding her class for her, I noticed that because the kids needed a brain break as well, 
they were just talking about uh, all different types of things. They want to show each other stuff. They want to have a show and tell. So what I want to have for them right now is a play date for them. I want to set up a play date for different gray bands to come together and have different breakout rooms within that and have different people managing it, but to also tie back in our families and our community, let the community also manage the spaces of those rooms. Because also we got to think about it. I don't want to put that all completely on our teachers. Our teachers are burned out. Anybody who works for the school system, I mean, even some of our parents too, are they're tapped. But we have a lot of people who want to do so. Let's tie in that community. Let's bring in that community. They want to do. There are a lot of people who are willing to be involved. And the one thing I would definitely say is make sure you understand your community. Sometimes your parents may seem like they're being a little over involved, but they just want what's the best for their child. And honestly, they just want to do. So give them something to do that is going to go along with the vision and mission of the school. And I think that's also really important. How does your engagement tie with the overall mission and vision of the school? I feel like a lot of times we do a lot of things, but we don't come back to the mission and vision where there's no vision, people perish. So to come back to the point where people don't perish, let's come back to the vision of the overall school. Okay, preach. <laughs> preach, Mr. Padgett, Principal Padgett. Absolutely. It should all be tied and a purpose and a value for your families and not just doing it because it sounds cool or it sounds great to do. Um, so great, great points um, that you brought. And I, and I, and I also to piggyback on what you said about knowing your community and making sure that you are providing, you're, you're making sure you're meeting the needs of your community. So you know what your students needs, need, you know what your parents need, and you're able to make those connections with them. That is super important. Uh, because what works in one district may not work in another district. And so you just have to know what works for you. Perfectly said, Mr. Pageant. Anything else? Anybody else wants to add on to that? You know, I think also when I was um, just listening um, um, to Mr. Pageant as well, um, you know, just thinking about, you know, just a, an idea of getting just the parents together. I think you know, a lot of times this is new in uncharted waters, like you said, Patricia, and, um, you know, what if, you know, a, a school district got just the parents together just to have like a, you know, hey, you know, this is what's going on. You know, sometimes, you know, we have like our PLNs, we have user groups, we have those types of things where we can talk about, you know, what's happening in our areas. But what if, you know, there is a, you know, an area where parents can just get together and talk and what's working with, you know, schedules, what's working with, you know, hey, I'm at home. Um, I'm not at home. You know, who's going to keep my kids? Um, I, I've heard of neighbors actually coming together and switching days where all of the kids actually meet in the neighborhood and all of them are online for some of the people that are at work you know it, it takes a village um you know and so you know there are a couple of kids you know in our neighborhood that you know are um virtual and you know we have to all you know kind of um bond together to work with that so you know it's a really cool um idea you know that I was kind of you know thinking about you know while I was hearing um Christian you know speak you know I think that's a, a something that you know all districts would think of having absolutely I, that was a great point Kim um I've heard of a lot of districts create or not districts parents creating pods of learning and pulling together a group of kids, I, that's phenomenal because it does take a village. You know, we can only do so much from the school level and we need our parents to be just as engaged and be able to feel comfortable. And I think that starts from creating that space in the school environment. When you when we are in person and we're, we're creating that welcoming space and that opportunity for the parents to get to know each other and learn from each other, they're more, they're, they're more, they're more keen to be able to do it on their own if they've been given the opportunity through the school. So I think that's super important. All right, so we are going to move on to our last question that we have. Um, when we're thinking about engaging our family, what, what exactly does that mean or what does that look like to you? Um, and I know we kind of share some of those engagement strategies earlier, but just kind of what other ideas do you have? And also, one other thing I want to add to that question is um, what advice would you give to 
another educator or a school leader in order to be able to provide that engagement. So what are some advice? I, Christian mentioned it earlier, we are out. A lot of teachers are tapped out of ideas, tapped out of resources at this point. As a matter of fact, if you send another website link or article or you know something of that nature, they're like, you know what, I'm done. So what can, what are some quick tips, some things that are, are um, ideas that you have that have worked well, or maybe even just some advice that you can give or a space that they can um, tap into to get, um, to make it through this, this time period that we're in. Any ideas? Are y'all tapped out too? <laughs> yeah, I can't <laughs> Just. I'll go. I was going to say, I think in terms of ideas, uh, well, first let me think about defining engagement. I'm sorry, I have my pen like Kamala had her pen real quick and I wrote some stuff down as she had my notes. Um, but no, in, ter in all honesty though, um, in terms of engagement, I think engagement is really around how are you forming authentic pieces to really move the student overall well, the student's overall well-being. I think that's the thing. What are the activities? What are the things that you're doing? And it doesn't have to be the grandiose things where we do the big drive-by parade, but how are you really making sure that people have what they need to have in order to be successful? Um, I think that's how I would define it first. I will say some engagement strategies, uh, something as simple as making sure you call, making sure that uh, you, know, you reach out yourself. Um, I will say that is me, that means for us, you know, we're about to have a second quarter where a good bit of our kids are going to be virtual still. So they will need their material still for the second quarter. So organizing the next drive through to make sure families have the materials that they need. Um, engagement is, while this is not my job necessarily, I did not go to school for computer information systems. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to try to troubleshoot this computer for you or this Chromebook and help make sure that you get what you need. Um, if it doesn't work, you know what, we'll figure out a way, but this is what it is. And those are what engagements mean, engagement means to me. And then last but not least, when you think about advice that you would give a school leader or a family or even a teacher about engaging during these unparalleled times, rule number one for parents. There are a lot of parents that know their power and there are parents that don't know their power. I need you to understand who's on your board. Board elections are typically the cheapest elections to ever run, but carry some of the most weight. Board elections typically cost less than $1,000 to run for. And these people carry the most weight. If you have an interest, know your power, know your voice. For teachers, well, especially if you went to school for elementary education, you were taught how to create these great projects and how to teach reading. But what nobody ever taught you is that school is a business. And so for you, I need you to understand that school is a business and you need to understand that a lot of decisions are made well above your principal and assistant principal. They are middle management. If you really wanna see some decisions being made, go look at those board and those board minutes. It might be looking, it might feel like C-SPAN and you're watching C-SPAN, but you need to be aware. And then last but not least for the leaders, take time, give yourself grace. For many principals, you work year round, you have not had a day off. So make sure you give yourself grace. And last but not least to everyone, I will tell you, know your place, stop doing other people's jobs. Make sure that you do your job and your job, especially for the teacher, is to teach. There are social workers, there are other people there that have a job, let them do their job. Do your job effectively instead of trying to figure out to be a jack of all trades and a master of none. And if you can get that part well, everything else will flow like nobody else's business. It will help things just become better and on top of that, learn when to consult up and take things off your plate so it doesn't stress you. And I feel like that's one of the problems that we've had. We've grown in this place where we put so much on people that we gotta pull back. And if we pull back, hey, we are gonna be like lemonade from the Chick-fil-A. On that note, I don't know if anybody else has anything oh. to add to what Christian said. Because, <laughs> oh my goodness, my goodness. I said it better. Everything that you said, Shit. I totally. <laughs> Shit. 
<laughs> Christian, could you just drop the mic? Even a Chick-fil-A lemonade. Yeah, just drop, just, yeah. Just drop just the mic. Bomb. That's it. Um, hey. Absolutely. Um, I love what you said about staying in your lane and, and knowing that you have to pay attention to what is happening in your district and decisions that are being made. And that goes for parents as well as teachers. Uh, that is super important, super important. So thank you for, for sharing those nuggets, Principal yeah. Pageant. That was awesome. No problem. <laughs> yeah, so I think what we're gonna do is I'll ask for any final words that anybody has to add, um, um, just maybe just one little tidbit or something that you could provide for our audience to kind of encourage them to continue on with the work that uh, we're doing. Um, and um, I'll start with Matt, you can start. Sure, um, yeah, Christian's hard to follow. That was awesome. Um, what, one idea that I wanna bring up is um, to kind of build on Christian's idea is whose voices aren't being heard. Um, you know, at the board level, but one disturbing pattern that I've noticed across the country, and I'm putting an article in the chat, is um, students who aren't showing up, who are going missing um, forever. Um, and part of that is when you think about it, there's economic dislocation. Um, you know, people are moving into apartments, people are, you know, um, finding different places to live, maybe in a shelter. And our enrollment in our district has actually gone down. Um, and our counselors are reaching out to all students and we try to have a plan to make all those phone calls. But the truth of the matter is people are so overwhelmed um, that I, I'm wondering in all our districts, are we asking that question, where are all of our students? Because I think that some families are so overwhelmed that school is, you know, um, a second or third or fourth order of importance as, as opposed, you know, I mean, they're just trying to survive. So um, asking that question to see if you do indeed have students who um, just didn't come back this fall, but maybe you're still living in your community. Um, so that, yeah, that article does a good job of talking about those missing students and yeah, just asking that question in your school. Um, are all our students accounted for? And if they're not, you know, what are we gonna do about it? Definitely. That's no different than <clears throat> our students that sit in the back of the classroom with their head down or not coming to class or paying attention. We wouldn't leave those kids out. So we just have to make sure that we are reaching out. So definitely agree, Matt. Chantel, any final words or? You know, I think one, it's important to remember everybody's, I'm going, you know, positive intent. Everyone's here for what we think is best and good and right for kids. And something that is often forgotten is that good instruction is good instruction. In the classroom, online, it comes back to what are you doing based on what the youth are showing you they need? And how are you keeping that continued? You know, how are you showing them that they're valued, that they're heard, that they're seen? Even if it's just through the computer, you can still do that. Like good instruction at the end of the day is still gonna be good instruction. Very well said. Kim? You know, I'll leave with this. You know, it's okay to make mistakes. Um, it's okay. Um, when things happen, um, I just think that um, everyone um, that's in some form um, of education, you know, you really just need to just take a step back and take a deep breath and that and know that it's going to be okay. Um, there's no such thing as failure, I don't think, in COVID-19. Um, and whatever you're doing, you're doing something and that, that's what matters. Um, so I'll just leave it like that. Great point. And at the end of the day, if it doesn't go right, just say, just blame it on 2020. Just blame yeah. it on 2020, blame it on COVID. That's it. Everybody be like, oh, COVID. Okay, yeah. That's, that's I get it. <laughs> that's what you can say. All right, I'll give uh, Principal Padgett the last word. <laughs> Not the last word. I just have one last thing to say. And I know I said a lot before, but just to sum it all up, 
for teachers, principals, and even for parents. Remember, power struggle. Don't get into it with one another. And because I will say this space has taken us out of our norm where we used to have so much power, especially as educators, that we no longer have that same type of power anymore. So just recognize that. It's a growth mindset piece. And last but not least for everyone, sometimes we're mad at the decisions. Don't get mad at the decisions. Go back to the policy. A lot of decisions are based on the policies. So don't get mad with the person, get mad with the policy. And let's figure out how we can change policies. Spoken like a principal. <laughs> policy, policy. Great. Oh, I just want to thank you all for um, being a part of this conversation. It was a great conversation um, with a lot of nuggets, a lot of, a lot of great ideas have been populated in this webinar tonight. And I'm hoping that our listeners, even if you're not live on with us now, you'll go back and you'll listen and be able to rewatch the video and really um, connect with what was said by our different panelists. Um, be on a lookout for our next webinar coming up on October the 27th. Uh, we will be hosting another webinar. We'll have another dynamic group of panelists that will be talking and sharing ideas on how to deal with this pandemic in this um, virtual environment or this hybrid environment or in-person environment, whatever you are dealing with at the time, you will be able to come away from the webinar with some through but maintain and and um, have a positive outlook on what is happening right now so thank you all for joining us tonight and we will see you again soon well we can talk because the only people in here <laughs>